recording then? We are. We are not live, but we are really. So I'll just start. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks very much for joining us. We're here at Cambridge's Center for Material Culture and would like to welcome you all from wherever you're joining from. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Turk. I'm a research associate in the Department of Social Anthropology here at Cambridge, and I have the privilege of chairing tonight's event. Um, first, I'll introduce our speakers, uh, then I'll briefly introduce our event and situate it within our ongoing research project. I'll then introduce the structure for an hour and a half together and then pass it over to our speakers. So joining us shortly will be um, an honored guest of ours uh, named Janko Lodrehu, the director of the National Museum of Mongolia. Um, we have Dr. Mark Elliott, senior curator in anthropology at Cambridge's Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. Um, he's responsible for the Asian, European, and African ethnography collections here. Dr. Doran Chime Ujed, research associate at the Mongolia and Inner Asia Studies Unit. Naren Chime Jukova, curator and academic researcher at the National Museum of Mongolia, who specializes in Mongolian Buddhism and history. Dr. Darohni Peng, lecturer at the Inner Mongolia University, who specializes in Khitan languages. And last but not least, Flo Sutton, who has a wealth of experience with collections at the MAA and elsewhere. She currently helps deliver practical collections works uh, in the anthropology section of the MAA. So our overall aim for this event um, is to ask what objects can tell us about healing heritage and cultural change. We will focus on a 150-year-old shamanist's outfit, drum, and other accessories from what is now Inner Mongolia in Northeast China. Uh, that has been in the care of Cambridge's Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology since the 1930s. Even though the anthropologist Ethel Lindgren, who collected the shaman's outfit, wrote in detail about it, there are still significant gaps in knowledge. Given the materiality of the tunic and related objects, we've decided to explore them as an assemblage or a constellation of distinctive entities that could, from a different standpoint of perspective, be consider considered singular standalone things in their own right, the bells, mirrors, cuckoo birds, weasel pelts, and so on. Some of the elements of the assemblage have been repurposed from other, other places, other things. Uh, a cloth material from a bag of flour, for instance, and elaborately embroidered sections of a military jacket. So this approach of exploring the assemblageness of the shaman's outfit um, will be reflected in a few of the small presentations uh, we'll hear this evening. Um, as these presentations focus on one element of the assemblage and explore in detail what it can tell us. If this is our first methodological approach, then there is a second one that, we also, that we're also engaging in. So we consider that cautious comparison might help us bridge gaps in knowledge that exist about the tunic and accessories. The question for us is then, how can we triangulate other historical and contemporary objects, documents, and practices on inner Asian culture and shamanism more specifically to bridge these blanks in knowledge? Of course, there are important limits to what we can know by drawing on other sources, and we'll discuss those limitations as well. But for me, I guess what's, what's especially interesting and exciting about this approach is that it invites um, a more general reflection on the processes by which partially evidenced yet speculative theory becomes recognized fact. So it's worth briefly noting that this event is part of an ongoing research project funded by the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Council entitled Mongolian Cosmopolitical Heritage tracing divergent healing practices across the Mongolian Chinese border. The project examines the political, economic, and other historical conditions that have led to di divergent and contested reappropriations of a common Mongolian uh, cosmological heritage, and specifically in the realm of healing arts. So each, each of us will speak for between five and 10 minutes, um, presenting on various aspects of the shamanist's tunic and its life here at the MAA. Uh, Director Jarga, if she can make it, uh, will deliver a short keynote conclusion. Um, and then we'll have 20 to 30 minutes of Q&A with you all. And we're really excited to hear from you. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to Mark. Thank you very much. And um, I'm going to do the awkward screen sharing at the moment. Um, bear with me. Right. So. Um, Great, so I, I just, uh, on behalf of MAA, I want to welcome our guests and our audiences online uh, to the Centre for Material Culture, which is a new research space uh, here in Cambridge where scholars, students, local groups and indigenous communities will in the future have access to the reserved collections of MAA, the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. 
The museum cares for around 1 million artifacts and historic photographs from across the world and every period in human prehistory and history, assembled over 140 years since the museum was established in 1883. Less than 1% of the collections, though, are on display in the museum on Downing Street, and much of our work here at the museum is focused on making the collections not on display more visible and more knowable by staff, as well as by our audiences and stakeholders globally and locally. We're in the middle of an ambitious project to photograph, redocument, and rehouse over 300,000 of these artifacts that we care for, the results of which can be seen on our online database at collections.maa.cam.ac.uk. And we'll put that address in the chat. Please take a look. Our focus this evening, though, or at least our starting point, is one of the items not currently on display, this extraordinary assemblage from Inner Mongolia in Northeast China. It's the almost complete shape, dress of a shaman from the Numenchen community. The young female shaman who wore it died in 1929 aged only 25. We don't know her name or much else about her, but in March 1932, her father, who we uh, understand was named Dilshinka, sold the costume to Cambridge anthropologist Dr. Ethel John Lindgren, as there was no one in the community who would take on the role of shaman. A year later, Lindgren's extensive collection of artifacts from the region was purchased for the museum by the then director, Louis Clark. Now, over its 90-year history at MAA, the shaman's costume, which Lindgren said was known as a samashi in the Nomenchen language, and is the uh, term we use for it here, has been one of the most prominent and visible objects from Asia at the museum. It was displayed for decades in the museum galleries until 2008, and since then has been shown, told, and retold in major exhibitions in the museum and beyond. While the focus has been often on the poignant story of the unnamed young woman who wore it, the costume has also been used as a window into the diverse set of practices uh, known as shamanism, and thus as a window into other worlds and other states of being, from the present to the Mesolithic period 11,000 years ago. And I suppose, following on from what uh, um, what we heard in the introduction, the, this is this is one of the things that I feel brings us all together today. The, the possibility of an assemblage like this, or indeed of any objects, to um, to help us think through various things, to help us enter um, uh, enter into an exercise in 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 comparison, in, um, in 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 reflection, and to to think about how this object, how it's worn, how it's used, and maybe even how we care for it today in a museum or how, the, how these objects are cared for outside of the museum might help us understand practices uh, today and, uh, and long ago. And with that, that's plenty from me. I would like to hand over to the rest of our panelists tonight who know certainly more than me and uh, we'll hand over to Flo uh, first, who is, going to talk about the experiences of caring for it, I think. Thank you. And I will stop sharing. Should I sit there? Or uh, am I, I okay here? Yeah, I think you're okay there. All right, sure. great. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I So I want to pose maybe a, more of a set of questions um, about caring for the assemblage. Um, so there are several uh, things that we have to really consider when caring for an assemblage like this in a museum and in a museum <laughs> in the modern world. Um, so the main uh, uh, dichotomy, I guess, about uh, looking after this uh, uh, for me is that we have to look after the context and the significance um, and share that with the public. Um, as well as caring for the actual materials that it's made of, um, making sure it lasts as long as it possibly can, um, which is what museums do, as we know. Um, so to start with storage, um, normally we would store different materials uh, separately as much as we possibly can. That's because uh, different materials do need uh, different environmental conditions like humidity, temperature, uh, different monitoring for pests such as moths and beetles, 
um, and a lot and different treatment in all aspects, different boxes, different um, shelves, all of these things. But this is an assemblage, and we've decided uh, in the past it's all been broadly been stored separately, but uh, now we're deciding to bring it together in the Centre for Material Culture. Um, it all lives together because it's understood that it, it belongs together contextually, which I think is the right way, but then that obviously poses um, difficulties for care in some ways. Um, second thing is uh, the experiences around the objects um, that might have been, that are intrinsically attached to what it is. So for example, what it's like to wear the coat, um, what it's like to hear the uh, quantity, sheer quantity of mirrors and bells and attachments that are on the coat and all of the materials, uh, the symbols, the drum, um, we can't really know that today because it's in a museum. We can't clash symbols, bang the drum. It's old and it's fragile and that isn't what museums do. But then what is it here for if we can't experience all of these things that go with its materiality? Um, so that's another question. Um, and then, of course, there's handling. Uh, we can't feel the object. So thinking about the senses, we can't um, touch it, touch the objects with our bare skin, really, mainly because of uh, historic pesticides being used on some of the items. So, for example, there's quite a lot of furs and skins need to be protected from pests. We don't put pesticides on the objects anymore, but in the past, poisonous pesticides would have been used and now we have to be very careful about what we handle with our bare skin. Um, and then finally display, um, this is assemblage, mainly the coat has been <clears throat> displayed extensively at MAA, um, which is great, um, everyone should see it, um, but it does mean that it fades because of light um, and it's we know this for a fact because there are a lot of uh, watercolour drawings, watercolour paintings by Edith, Edith King, who I think worked with Ethel John Lindgren. Um, and she uh, basically copied all the objects in amazing detail, really beautiful watercolours, but they're all really lovely bright colours and we just don't see that today. And you can see under folds, um, under on the underside of objects that the colours are very different. So uh, yeah, that's another thing that the very nature of the museum, we have to display things, we want to display things, we want people to see them, but then that's meaning that the material, materiality of the objects is changing. Uh, so how do we square that? Um, and I think that's about everything that I wanted to raise um, and I hope um, everything else we hear today might start to answer some of those questions. Thank you. So I will share the screen once more and we can hand over to our next speaker. Okay. Um, if you um, come over there. Yeah, yeah, because you can do the slides. Okay. Yeah. Can I just Yeah, just, okay. Mm -hmm. just back okay. Hello, thank you for joining our event. I'd like to talk briefly about this Lincoln's uh, expedition and the regional cultural background. Uh, Dr. Ethel John Lingurin was one of the very few Western anthropologists to carry out research in Mongolia and Manchuria, especially in the early 20th century. She was born in Evanston, Illinois, and by her late teens was already traveling in the Far East with her family and learning Chinese and Japanese. She came to England to read Chinese and psychology in Cambridge. She learned Russian 
and also spoke Swedish, French, German, as well as some Dutch, Mongolian, and Tungus. She went to Mongolia, but because of political events caught up with her and was under virtual house arrest in Orga, present in for many months. She met Oscar Marman, who had been working in Siberia on a part of preservation process and moved to Mongolia to escape the uh, revolution in uh, Russia and the civil war. Lingrin hired him as her photographer. Later, they got married. So with Marman, she went to Manchuria, where she visited the reindeer Tungus, uh, also called Oranchon Ubangi, and Russian-speaking Cossacks. Among the Tungus, she established a close relationship with a female shaman called Olga, uh, who, whose ritual and beliefs she studied and described in her PhD thesis. Over six feet tall, Dr. Lindgren was an impressive figure. Her Mongolian nickname was Mangus, which means a giant, giant lady. She was quite popular because she traveled all over this region. Dr. Lindgren became a fellow of Newnham College and lecturer in the Faculty of Archaeology and Anthropology. Uh, she was uh, also a member of Anglo-Mongolian society almost from her inception and uh, thereafter played a prominent part in these affairs. She was a committee member from 1979 until her death. So I'd like to move on to the region, to introduce briefly about the region where Lingrin uh, carried out the field work. It was called North Western Manchuria, uh, known uh, in, in the West, and also Paraga region, but the present day it is Tulumbe, called Tulumbe of Inner Mongolia. The map. Uh, Ulumbad is uh, this uh, northeastern, actually, this uh, most part of Inner Mongolia. This is Inner Mongolia and the uh, bordering, of course, Mongolia, and uh, this, especially this uh, Manchu northwestern Manchuria bordering Russia. Uh, there were at least 11 ethnic groups, maybe left here, yeah, included in Ulumbad. This is the Hulumbe, map of Hulumbe. Um, in the time of Lingurin and Marman's expedition in 1929 to 1932, three times, they were, uh, as Lingurin said, five Mongolian ethnic groups of Taur, uh, Chipchin, also Old Barga, Oluts, and then New Barga. Transbaikal Boryat, also called Sinohom Boryat, and then four Tungus groups of Solon, Kingan Tungus, also called Numinchin, where our this uh, shaman costume from, uh, Transbaikal Tungus, also called Hamnigan, and Ruindia Tungus, also called Oranchon, in northernmost forest, as well as Chinese and Russian. The history of tribal distribution in Bloomberg began in the 17th century after the conquest of China. Uh, the Manchu, Manchu court made a strong effort to rectify the frontier situation and moved, moved of, most of these ethnic groups to Bloomberg from different places, from uh, further south, Portugal region, and then later uh, from Mongolia, some came from Mongolia, this new Varga, and then uh, the last group uh, was this uh, Transbaikal Boryat and Hamnigan together from Russia in 19, started from 1918 because of this Russian revolution. So expedition, this is the uh, Lingurin's travel map. It's a center, it's a Hailar, it's Hailar. And then here's Hailar and then north of Hailar to all this reindeer urban group and south of Hailar, some Mongolian groups and then this uh, Numanchin, this Numanchin people, and then also west of Hailar, uh, this uh, New Barca people. In spring uh, 1929, Lingurin and Marman moved to the city of Hailar in northeastern Inner Mongolia, uh, also called uh, Northwestern Manchuria. There she continued to pursue her Mongolian studies and learned about the existence of a uh, reindeer breeding people in the northernmost part of Inner Mongolia. Uh, at that time, people say uh, these people were really shy and people can't, can't uh, uh, 
see them, just avoid meeting people. In June 1929, accompanied by this uh, high son, a ta a Taur, the couple set off for their first journey to the remote region of northwestern Manchuria. After the hard attempt, they found the group of reindeer herders. Then they returned southward approximately on the 15th of August, 1929. In January, 1930, Lingudin came back to Cambridge. Uh, her best travel companion, Oscar Marmon, became her husband then. The couple did not live very long in England and set off for China in December. Uh, June and July, 1931 were uh, spent in Hailan. On 3rd August, Lingudin Marmon, with uh, again this Taur Haisan and another Tatar called Pilal Solo, made their way from Hailar southward this time, the river Imin, here he sounds, uh, up to its upper reaches. Uh, they crossed the Great Hingan watershed with uh, back pack horses and went into the basin of the Troll River. On both sides of the watershed, they visited Oranchon camps. Returning from the Troll, they ported the Imin and went to the Ganjul Pier in the western side of uh, Hailar, which is New Barga. On 15 September 1931, the company came back to Hailar. In mid-October, Ilingurin and her group started their second journey to the Rindyo Tungus, uh, the north, north of Hailar. In early December 1931, they visit, the visit was brought to a certain end by a critical condition of their horse. Then in March 1932, Lingurin and Maman revisited uh, the Jolly and Yimin area in the south of Hailar again. The third and last journey to the Rindyo Tungus lasted from May uh, to July 1932. So this, this is the, this is the timeline of their expedition. Then ethnography. During their expedition in the Northwestern Manchuria, Lingudun and Maman produced visual archives of um, 8,813 8, photographs, uh, 1,500 feet of 16 millimeter film covering all minorities in the area. The collection provided some of the earliest known photographs of the diverse peoples and landscape of the region. Lingurun also collected over 200 material artifacts. The Lingurun collection is extremely important as it documents the changing conditions in Northwest Manchuria and Mongolia at a crucial stage uh, in a political, social, economic history. So it was a, a I'll just omit this. Uh, then uh, the topics covers a really wide range of uh, this culture by by ethnicity, by gender, by ages, status, and uh, a lot of profile pictures. Uh, maybe it's uh, uh, useful for maybe uh, uh, physical anthropology. Mm -hmm. And then dwellings, herding, hunting, fishing, agriculture, trade, industry, foresting, transportation, and all kinds of this transportation, means of transportation, religion, Buddhism, and shamanism. And then a lot of other rituals there. So, I will just briefly introduce shamanism here. Uh, this uh, shamanism is um, uh, one of the main focus of Linguri. So uh, most of the ethnic groups I mentioned earlier in that area practice shamanism, apart from uh, New Barga and Boreas, they came later after uh, this uh, converted Buddhism in Mongolia and Russia. That's why they, they didn't have uh, shamanism. Others all. Actually, the Bodhiyat also had a few shamans there. Yeah? So uh, I'd like to just show briefly about this shaman pictures. Uh, more, uh, 
First, the reindeer shaman, which is the main focus of Lingurin, which is included in uh, her thesis. This, and then second one is uh, that this group of shaman is not from, not by Lingurin. Uh, this is Shrokokorov uh, earlier, it's a, a group of shamans. And then next one, uh, this is Tahu shaman, really famous uh, this, uh, from noble family, Panga uh, shaman. And then Hamnigan. Next one. Uh, this is uh, Hamnigan, also called uh, the Transcritical Tungus Shaman, called Naren. And then this is Solen Shaman, not in, in her costume. And then, uh, uh, of course, this Numanji Shaman, this dress, not uh, the person herself, because she died before, uh, the three years before Lingurin visited. So Numanji is also called the Hingan Tungus tribe. Uh, they are called Numanjin because they came from Numin River. That's why they call themselves Numanjin. And uh, they were only 30 families when uh, Lingurin visited. And uh, the Wilson people were uh, kept uh, keeping cattle and very occasionally sheep and goats. Mostly they uh, rely on hunting. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, they were wiped out by neighboring ethnic group because of this uh, horse stealing. They were quite known uh, known for their horse stealing, <laughs> so, and then it means they no, no longer exist. So this is what. <laughs> uh, I would like to introduce in relation to our this object here. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. And then uh, uh, I will sh uh, show you. I would like to share something about the bells on the Namanchin uh, shaman costume. And this is the picture of Namanchin shaman costume. And here we can see uh, in the lower part of that and the lower part of that there are so many rows of bells there and uh, in, in different sizes uh the smaller one smaller one here and the larger one here and then uh also on the shoulders on the shoulders there are two uh smaller bells here and here the bells and then this is the shape of that bells uh, with a tiger, tiger bell. This is, mm. These are tiger bells with the Chinese characters and different uh, motifs there. Uh, sometimes clouds and, and sun and moon, maybe. And then what do uh, bells symbolize in uh, Samanism? Uh, let's see quickly. Among the other people, little copper bells. Uh, were fastened to the sleeves of Samanic costumes and about according to the LA, they symbolize the voice uh, of seven uh, classical virgins. And then, and uh, then uh, uh, Pop Robob considers that the bells and jingles in the trans boxes were associated with the cult actions. They associated their sem semantic with the uh, upper world and astral conception. And the function of little bells in, uh, and the jingles and burials consisted of evoking the shaman's helper spirit in order to help the deceased in the journey to the uh, other world. And then uh, we can also see uh, some bells uh, on, on today's present shaman's costume. Uh, this is the Hartsin shaman crown with bells. So you can see here uh, a bird, uh, three birds, and then two bells there, and also this one, and also the bells here. So you can see that. And then uh, this is, uh, we have seen uh, already that Dabur Shaman uh, in, in her full costume. And here also, like this no mention uh, costume, there are uh, a lot of bells there. Uh, 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 and this one, uh, and these are the Korean Shaman's bells. Uh, so we see, 
Mm. As we see that in today's uh, shamans, we have a lot of uh, bows used. And then I will show you a very special coffin from a, uh, from a, a Kipan tomb. Uh, and this, let's see it. Uh, this is a 1,000 year old Kitan tomb in Hobbitin Oil Mountains were found in 2003. And uh, this is very special. Why it is special? Because uh, here we can see there are a lot of bells there around and surrounded the uh, coffin. And then this coffin is uh, consists of Mm, the outer coffin, so we can see it clearly, the outer coffin and inner coffin, and also the coffin platform here. So we can see uh, around the outer coffin, there are a rows of bells, and then the, uh, around, surrounded the uh, platform, uh, there are two rows of bells also, gilt brown bells. So we can see it clearly. This is the bigger picture here, the brass bells. Uh, surrounded the uh, outer coffin. And then we see next one, uh, this is on the, this is bells with different shapes of motifs on that uh, around the uh, platform. And then uh, besides those uh, bells on the coffin, there are still, uh, the, 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 the tomb owner also wears a lot of bells there. Uh, so this is very tiny bells on the uh, golden one on the headwear on, on, on her head. And then these bells were from uh, her ankle and uh, he wears uh, the bells there. Uh, so um, about the coffin and about this tomb and about the uh, tomb owner based on the burial object of, and the skill of the tomb, it can be determined that the owner of the tomb is Lady of the royal family of Liao and Kitan and maybe a princess of the early period of Kidan. Uh, but according to so many, a large amount of uh, unearthed bells, uh, the scholars saw that, determined that uh, she was a shaman. She was a shaman. Also, uh, there are a horn and also the mirrors. Uh, so they determined that, mm, that she may be a shaman. Uh, although uh, there are no definite conclusion on her uh, identity. Uh, so I want to also uh, to share uh, some something like also on our uh, display, uh, the cradles. Uh, so on the, on the top back of the cradles, there are uh, something like um, bell-like decorations. This is made from the bullet box uh, for jingling maybe, <laughs> so also collected by the Dr. Ling Green. Uh, so maybe uh, the bells uh, in, uh, not only in the shamanic ritual, but also in uh, uh, in in a lot of, uh, in ca uh, various kinds of cultures, they have a significant uh, meanings or important uh, important meanings there. So this is the jingle bell for the Christian. And also this one is in the uh, Buddhist temple, uh, the, the bells, the bronze bells. And this one is the bells and um, uh, bells on the bracelets and on, on the necklace uh, of giving to the babies in China uh, for praying them uh, safety and health. So uh, from that, we can see that uh, the bells, uh, the bells are important or uh, not only in the Samanic, but also in various uh, culture, I think. So this is a, a interesting one. So I want to share today. Okay. Thank you very much. I wanted to share my little story. It's maybe some people it's easy, some people maybe it's a little bit kind of a different culture. Why I'm choosing couples in different works in very special in our tradition because we are a little bit nomadic, so that's why 
we are also live in the nature. So that's why all this kind of the piece of the nature. So that's why shaman usually involved with the birds and the nature. So that's why I'm to suggest karakos and the birds have the in Mongolian physical context and the house connected in the shamanic world. So that's why a little bit uh, just uh, so uh, it needs a lot of X time. So that's why I choose it just a little bit. Sorry. Uh, especially in birds in Namata culture and tradition, we have usually three main things. One is from ancient times, birds are believed as totem and presentation of the upper world. We can say upper world is here and maybe sky can fly. We can uh, describe describe another world, but we just only can say upper world or even we just, just thinking like that. Uh, within nomadic culture, especially in ancient Asia, birds were symbol of the deer's origin and high status of us having originated in upper heaven. Birdman is a dress is still uh, a belief that person becomes a bird after a deed. Many people reported in history that they blew away like birds after they died, especially when the high rank nobleman dies. It is written that he has killed him. Uh, next thing is um, birds are symbol of the high origin and nomadic tradition. If you see in Mongolian tradition, if you see in whole the nomadic culture, we can easily find for was kind of the emblem of the high aristocratic and high noblemen's symbols and the signs. Especially you can see on the screen, it's usually Mongolians and the Namatk's first state was. It's a, a period of the first century of the uh, common era. Uh, that the golden diadem on the top, it's very similar with no mention shaman's costume. If you very see uh, closely, it's very similar with the kakpo. If you see he and the uh, birds uh, figure, it's very similar to no mention both the both uh, he dress. So that's why I choose it in here. Uh, in new golden diadem. Another one thing is uh, in Mongolia we no popular no is Billy Khan's the golden crown. It's uh, related to eighth uh, century. It's Turik Khanat. Uh, what we just thinking about it was they are saying they are usually from heaven. They are like that the aristocrat saying what does. But the, after that, uh, so we be thinking differently because it's just as saying they are already died. They went to the heaven as kind of the symbolic saying that. Uh, another one thing is uh, birds in shaman costume, costumes. Uh, was very different to us. Especially on the screen, we are shown one uh, course, the picture, it was uh, in Mongolian uh, Western sites, we, uh, our Mongolian archaeologists uh, discovered. Uh, first, the archaeologists uh, thought it was just a men's full coat and uh, hat. But uh, I am seeing now it's uh, uh, that times kind of the shaman peoples may be dress. If you see on the heat, uh, heat dress looks like a bird. If you see on a, another side, see Namchumbo's heat dress, it looks like deer, deer's antlers and the uh, kakus. If you see our Mongolis, uh, Mongol Altai's uh, uh, wealth hat, if you see dress kind of as one's figure, uh, but on the hat also a hat, had uh, the deer's figure, wooden deer's. It means we are saying uh, before uh, mid of the before revolution, uh, we had broad knowledge of the shamans. But after revolution, seventy years, we realized our religions, other knowledge about shamans. 
So that's why after the industrial revolution and the, the lot of archaeology discovery didn't be uh, kind of say it was kind of the shaman's post we didn't tell to public, just only we figure out this kind of the main code. We tell, it's tell is maybe it's animal tell, the, the, not the lot of time. So that's why I come in here. I compare it with the Nomenjumpo, which the Paisiric, you catch us, uh, that who called is exactly similar meaning. So uh, I'm saying we are, uh, thanks for this uh, Nomenjumpo's costume because we can see past the uh, eras. Mm -hmm. How costume was the uh, shaman's costume, and how was religion was how shamanism in was Mongolian Western sections, especially in the West Mongolian section. Uh, we are uh, can see just the uh, how was Mamanchimbo and the or southern shaman's costume in the Manjure area. It means completely same whole the world of the from West. Uh, nomadic area until Eastern we was before revolution one country we was one group of the nomadic was saying uh, just we had uh, a lot of the roof uh, it's uh, we can see from the nomadic post costume so it means the uh, nomadic costume have is valuable object artifacts we can uh, roof we can explain everything from Mongolians, I'm explaining some objects from the knowledgeable the costume. So that's why boards and the shaman costume, some elements uh, explain our old history. Because uh, usually, book usually also goes by oral history, new writing on the books, writing something resource we have. So it's costumes tell something to our, another way is Mongolian, some ancient Especially this Pazeric uh, uh, full coat is uh, related to uh, fifth or twelfth century uh, before Common Era. But our Nomenchen Bos costume is related to mid of the 20th century. It's the uh, same as the power nomadic culture uh, keeping their tradition very uh, I like that how this English was is uh, it's really amazing, isn't it? Because we have longer we was very vast shaman was it still it's early, isn't it? However, no mention nation is not in and uh, now, but uh, a lot of uh, information left by the that costume. So that's why it's uh, Lindbergh's collection. How is the very uh, what you work for things. I want not to say. Another one thing is uh, human sports about that uh, because uh, all the nomadic people usually believe in the bird for this kind of the symbol of animal from, uh, from the human because hunters usually say if they want to hunt them, before hunting, they never show the knives and the arrows and the knives to the animals because uh, if birds see, it's really it gives information to others. They usually hunters believe that. Another way in Mongolia, we have very strong way tradition. If somebody dies, some people comes into a youth and a Mongolian house, like they comes into youth house like birds and takes out the uh, body of the died. So that's why in Mongolia we have tradition. Don't see it like that bird. It's kind of the harsh tradition because words usually comes to take homes so into human and into other world. So that's why we have still in Shamanda tradition, still we have uh, oral tradition said to the people don't sit like that bird, don't like that big bird because bird is human's animal. It's kind of the symbolic tradition with our tradition. Another one, another one thing is, is um, in Mongolian history, especially 12th and 13th centuries, the balcon was the kind of a symbol Mongolian kings was used to uh, accompany funerals and depicted on the artifacts. It's just only saying kings I'm from heaven, 
So that's why they had uh, a lot of luxury birds, uh, futures on the fat tops. It's until was Manju period was very powerful, especially we know Manju period is kings usually had on their peacocks. Mm -hmm. They show in their songs, isn't it? So it's, it's still um, Manju is as well as nomadic uh, tradition and nomadic nation. So we together uh, usually had similar traditions. So that's why Manju Mongolia easily become united and they, they wanted to each other and the rule. So uh, they, until 20th century, they become one union, isn't it? So that's why we didn't say Manju period is not so much harsh from Mongolian history because we wanted to save our nation from the powerful Russia, powerful, um, that time Russia is step by step by into Mongolian area. So that's why we decided to underrule Manchu nation we, because we have one tradition. So Zanata decided that times. Okay, another one thing is uh, this all the, is uh, just a few examples of how Namad's understand and live in harmony with nature. Uh, Lit, I will very quickly explain another one thing is. Uh, another, if we see, if we see a Norwegian birds a costume, all the costume is combination of the deer and the bird. So firstly, I wanted to explain how uh, the deer become the amount of the human because we have a long tradition at Bronze Age, and then we have Iron Age, then we have first the uh, Hunu stage. We have all the roof of the about deer because after that. Uh, someone and died uh, for heroes, we usually we use it for all the deers. If you see straight with silver deers on the screen, it's a Bilike Han's tomb. We discovered this uh, silver uh, deer. If you see a deer with the wings, it means Bilike Han already flew away into heaven. Another one thing is Hunigural is Mongolian first. A state, ancient state, uh, usually aristocrat uh, tomb usually had a uh, woman's uh, body and uh, on the top section usually have antlers. It means before Bronze Age, we have too many thousand thousand we have deer stone. It means that just uh, deer is flown into human. It means they are grown to human carrying some stone. So that's why we have reach of the tradition about deer and the bull. Next one thing is uh, just I only want to one, like I said, this moment, uh, shaman in Greece is combination of the deer of the bird according to their ideology. Uh, Ethel John Lindgren noted that bird on the heaters of the Norwegian shamans is kako. Another one interesting thing is British Mongolian uh, John uh, Surat they did about kako, they surat how kako, uh, flow, fly into across the sea. They usually 12,000 kilometers go to Africa and come back to Mongolia. It was amazing because they usually very ability kako. Once a Mongolian very famous scholar about uh, talking about, usually shaman's people usually had dots on their shoulder. They part of if we a dangerous situation, that word is treated with X, so into human, but body is unconscious there talking about. Okay, it's time, sorry, but I have a lot of something. See if you have time, just see under my screen. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, we'll pass it over to Jagal Sladahu, the director of the National Museum of Mongolia, who we're so pleased to have with us. Yes, please um, have a seat wherever um, suits you. And Tomoko will be um, translating. Thank 
so, um, so she says, so, uh, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm really happy, I appreciate that I'm ha having sit with you uh, and having a meeting with all of you. And she said, um, it's her first time in the being in London, in the UK, and she's really appreciated being here. And um, uh, she's um, she's very um, thankful and very grateful for the for this project going about uh, healing and uh, traditional healing and the culture change about the project collaborating with the um, Corpus College uh, Corpus College and Dr. Dad, okay. departments and Asians especially uh, specified uh, specifically in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. So and uh, she also saying very thankful for the. Uh, giving us opportunities, especially in this uh, harsh, you know, changing this environment, and uh, we like to keep the, our tradition. And uh, it's very thankful for the uh, giving us opportunity, and we love to uh, collaborate and uh, go on for the the next projects. In you're not named Serin Soup, you since Serin. The here at the Moklum Stimuts, yet got in Tanris for Trani, which is not the Taran which are the Bitner of the Jews, the Bagman, Jarrah, and goes of the Moklum Stimuts, the near Bushat Ruin will be done. At the Bassiatin, Hogan, at the Hotter Stigel, at the Yamro, at the which here is just in the in Trapping Jack Elizabeth Tour, Elizabeth <laughs> so um um so um she says firstly she said um we having a um sixty thousand 
of uh, items, exhibitions in our exhibition about regarding a specific claim about shamans. And we were uh, very happy to announce an open exhibition, which is going to happen on the August and between August and September, and uh, which is is very happy to collaborate with you for long terms. And um, obviously, we had a very harsh moment about COVID and everything was, was delayed. And uh, uh, but it gives us very good opportunity and to open and then uh, more to do willing to more about our culture and. Uh, traditions and uh, she very thankful for the David Smith and all the Beth and everyone uh, for supporting us and uh, we like to yeah, continue and uh, all the research as well everyone is happy and, yeah and she's she, she's very grateful that she the Cambridge University she being a collaborative the Cambridge especially research in Cambridge University because Cambridge is one of the world's well-known school and uh, very popular, so um, very thank you for every professor and professor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> okay, great. Um, I think let's try to open it up to questions if we've got any online. And let me just take a quick look. Um, I've got a few in case people need some time to think. Um, Okay. So we have to escape from that. Yeah, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what the Bible is. Okay, great. So um if you have any questions, um a couple ways to um ask. One would be just to raise the little hand down in the Zoom. Yeah, in the Zoom sort of I think it's reactions. Um, you can raise raise a hand, uh, you can queue at the top, or um, if you prefer just to type your questions, we can read them out as well. Um, so while folks are thinking, I, I have a question um, uh, for our panelists, and it has to do with, um, but I guess something that Mark had mentioned before, um, when we were sort of working with the Samashi or the Dell on a different um, occasion, and it was, um, I'm not watching your question, but it was, you know, is this, is this a typical tunic for um, shamans uh, in the new mention culture, or is this a distinctive tunic for the mm -hmm. new mention? Because it's hard to know we have one. Yeah. Um, and it reminded me of something that um, Madam Chimeki said when the first time you saw it a few weeks ago, saying, "Wow, this is so gungun. This is so mm -hmm. fancy." Yeah. And you know how how elaborate, how um, you know all these all these displays of wealth and prestige. Um, and so I was wondering about the connections between shamanism and aristocracy, given sort of what you had said about birds. Uh, so can we make connections between the two? I mean, was there any connections you think between this shamanist and the aristocracy of her of her time? I uh, usually um, shaman people usually also connect connect the people to world, especially upper world maybe. So that's why all the nomadic people use in the words um, or the nature have to connect with the nature words one way is a board. So that's why they usually in class usually use it uh, board like that and I think so. Uh, in Mongolian Mongolian shaman we usually we very famous by falcon and the eagle usually use it for shaman's trance and uh, other centuries we had different uh, words but in here uh, just cut call so that's why it's maybe it's uh, uh, it's regional, maybe mm -hmm. something, maybe in here. I think so. Uh, but uh, our Mongolian, if the our Mongolian shaman's costume, see, it's not oh. it looks like uh, bird. Mm -hmm. If you see like that, there is a kind of a lot of snakes there. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of the uh, kind of the bells. But if if you if see the Norwegian boots, the costume the result. A lot of mirror, it looks like uh, armors. Mm -hmm. And if you see Norwegian boots, the costumes uh, tail section, it looks like like both. Mm -hmm. But in Mongolian costume, completely little bit different. I think so. And um, some things, especially very similar to Mongolian tradition, something is completely different. Mm -hmm. So some way it's easy to explain some way it's really 
too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> conversations, yeah. I think, around this table. So we've had multiple occasions, really interesting and inspiring. Yeah. Uh, another one thing is uh, our history, something is unclear, something, but in some sign symbology is very clear in the Norwegian post of costume, especially the before so kind of a symbol about three. But the three just only who knew period some carpet just two. But we didn't explain just only it's maybe three, it's not three. We have a lot of argument. But after that um, little bit story, it exactly must be three because it's shaman's world, isn't it? Yeah. Another one thing is uh, you can't hear. Oh, they can't hear. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess we should just speak louder or. Yeah, so okay. we have one person that can hear. Can everyone else hear? <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems to be working for some people. I'm not sure at the. Mm. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll we'll all make sure we project. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There is uh, some background noise. And that's that's true. Yes. <laughs> Another one thing is I wanna usually know about costume balls, costumes, how the tradition. See in Mongolia, have you some different tradition in Mongolia or similar tradition about birds? In Hutchin, mm -hmm. sorry, Hutchin shamanism, yeah. or their similar yeah. symbolism, symbolism of birds. Yes, yes. yes. It's 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 the crowns. Yeah, on the crowns. Uh, but it's the kind of the birds tradition is similar. Usually in Mongolia, if somebody dies, in the Mongolia, usually you strictly we doesn't like people go like that. Uh, board, birds seeds and goes in the their house. Yeah, we don't like birds coming into the house. Maybe this is Still in the shaman, we have in shaman, in Buddhism, usually have called the ego kind of the ritual, isn't it? After that, person usually have kind of the ceremony to call the ego because uh, in shaman, in Buddhism, usually. After the high person, yeah, yeah, usually sit you, mm -hmm. uh, put people outside and call them the bird. Mm -hmm. The bird comes in in the body, eats from mm his -hmm. body, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So it means words text body as well. Yeah. Like that things a lot of yeah. yeah. yeah Traditionally yeah. we we have a lot of things in nomadic. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Buddhism, so I wanted to kind of ask our panelists about connections between shamanism and Buddhism. Do we see any in this in this tunic, or are there ones that we can kind of make um, extrapolating from the tunic a bit further? So my question is about the connection between Buddhism and shamanism, and if we see anything materially in the tunic that helps make those connections. I can't see any. No. Just this, uh, uh, this uh, bow. This maybe the symbols. The yeah. symbols. Yeah. Symbols are used yeah. in good. Yeah. But in Mongolia, usually shaman usually there are the two sections. One is usually real shaman. One is usually yellow shaman. It means usually they take some Buddhist some mm. uh, ritual. They usually easily uh, take so that's why we call yellow shaman. It's usually very similar. Ritual like a like as the oracle lama. We call oracle lama usually like shaman people. They usually call the Buddhist spirits inside uh, body. So that's why in the Buddhism have like shamans ritual. It uh, that people call the oracle lama. Chaitanya lama is also like that lama. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
if we have any questions from participants or any other sort of lingering thoughts, or comments, questions for each other, mm -hmm. um, otherwise we can probably wrap wrap up our session. It's been about recording. It is recording. Okay. Um, well, that just leaves us to thank everyone for coming, and uh, um, I think yeah. that's it. Again, thank you so yes, much. Yes, to the right, panelists, of course. Yes, yes. Thank you. thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> so, how about just.